Hello, my name is Michelle Salinger and welcome to this plenary, Education Futures, Data and Creativity. I'm chairing this session. We have two speakers, Barbara Wasson from the University of Bergen in Norway and David White from the University of Arts in the UK. They will each give a short presentation, Barbara first on how we should think about making the best use of data, and then David on cultivating creativity online. Seemingly two very different presentations, but you will find some strong overlaps, which will lead to a very interesting discussion afterwards, especially with your comments and questions added into the debate. Um, as you can see, we've asked you to post your comments, thoughts and questions during each talk and also during the discussion afterwards. So let me introduce you to our first speaker. So that's Barbara Wasson. She is Director of the Centre of, Sci of the Science of Learning and Technology, or SLATE, and a professor at the Department of Information Science and Media Studies at the University of Bergen in Norway. After her PhD in Artificial Intelligence in Education in Canada in 1990, she moved to Norway, where she was introduced to Scandinavian understanding of the role of technology in practice, resulting in research on the use of aspects of technology in education. Barbara was one of the founders of Kaleidoscope, a European network of excellence on technology enhanced learning. And among her research interests are interaction design, CSCL, learning games, AI in education, e-assessment, teacher inquiry, and learning analytics. And the title of Barbara's talk is Data, Data Everywhere. Okay, over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Welcome. So today I'm going to talk about data and data everywhere. And this is sort of something you hear often nowadays that data is everywhere, but what is this data and what can we actually do with it? As Michelle mentioned, I'm the director for the Center of the Science of Learning and Technology. And to put a little bit into perspective why I'm interested in data, I can tell you that the center was established by the Norwegian Ministry of Education in 2016 as a national research and competence center. And we are focused on learning analytics, which uses a lot of data. So we're interested in learning analytics, big and small data in education, AI in education, assessment for learning, and learning and technology in all facets of human learning. And we work in a multidisciplinary uh, group. We have many different backgrounds, but we try to work in an interdisciplinary way. So when learning analytics is in focus, data is key. Data is needed to do this kind of analytics. And what I'm going to do today is give us a historical perspective on data and its use in the area of technology enhanced learning. And I'll use that, feat, that term technology enhanced learning as it, is a, it was considered a research area within the European Union. And it's just a nice embracing term. And I'm going to try to argue through all of this that the most important thing we can do with data is empowerment, empowering learners and teachers and researchers with this data and not so much for surveillance. I think it's good to think of empowerment. And I'll use this with historical. We could start back in the 50s with Skinner's machines, learning teaching machines, but we didn't have actually access to data at that point. So I'll start in the 60s with computer-aided instruction, computer-based learning. There must be at least 13 different titles for this kind of uh, technology enhanced learning. But the first published article was in 1963 by Patrick Supes from Stanford University. And he was talking about um, some of the programs that they had developed for learning mathematics and how it was tried. And what we would see in this kind of a system is typically you see a question, you have a selection of answers and you collect an answer and the answer is either right or wrong. And what done, was done with this data, so we had answer data, you could create a score, so you got 15 out of 20 on 20 questions. But what you got as a student was immediate feedback. You found out that your answer was right or wrong. But then this data was used to either give you uh, another question, depending on if you answered correctly, a different question if you answered wrong, and everybody got the same path through the learning material and the, the questions. So there was no individualization here at all. Then we move through uh, micro worlds in the late 60s and 70s. Here's some work by Barbara White and colleagues that's at uh, Berkeley on uh, what she called thinker tools or cognitive tools where students get to explore some simple um, uh, uh, interactive models. So we first got to see interactivity with uh, models. 
You used a keyboard or a joystick, if anyone remembers those, to be able to give force to a ball that moved across this uh, area here. And you tried to get the ball to land on the X. What they also gave you was a set of measurement tools so you could measure um, velocity and uh, direction and things like that. Sorry, I got pressed the wrong thing. And what we had here was the first signs of seeing what we call process data. We had observations of interviews of these things in work and they were trying to understand processes of learning. So instead of just whether someone answered something right or wrong, we tried to understand why and what they were doing that helped us, but it was still not um, collected digitally. There's a mo more modern day, uh, Jeremy Rochelle and his colleagues when at uh, UMass, they worked on a little bit more um, how students manipulate simulations. And we could, again, they use transcripts to understand these processes of learning, but the students got this manipulation of the simulation that gave them immediate feedback and they could see the graphs changing based on what they were doing. So we were giving empowerment to the learner to see how their actions gave some kind of uh, in action on the simulation. We can move through the constructionist environments, things that are based on Papert's work at uh, MIT where we could construct things. He used the Lego logo. You can see the Arduino kits nowadays, things like uh, Minecraft or SimCity where you can manipulate things, but I'll skip that and go straight to intelligent tutoring systems. So the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s and until the 90s, we started to see the application of artificial intelligence in education. And we saw some systems called intelligent tutoring systems. And here is a very conceptual architecture that you would see an intelligent tutoring system. And what I wanna point out here is we started to collect a lot of different kinds of data in these systems about students. So we collect their answers. We could program the system in a way that we could discover misconceptions that they had, what preferences they had for learning. And we could individualize learning and interact with the student based on a deeper understanding of their behavior. <clears throat> So we had planning algorithms and assessment algorithms that used all this data we were collecting about how they interacted with the system. And that allowed us to give again, immediate feedback to students, but we could give in individualized feedback and individualized tasks to students. So if in the computer aided instruction, everybody got the same tasks here, you got it individualized to you and the data was used to give us that. So we started to see the emergence of a field called educational data mining around 2000 that could use all of this information to make different choices in the system, like choosing activities or different examples, ways to give explanations, how to sequence the instruction, when to provide hints, et cetera. It was a large field of research. And here's an example from a friend of mine, Janice Goldberg, in some of the work they have done on a system where um, students are learning a scientific method. It's a simulated lab and it's, it's one of the, a good application of showing assessment and how data can be used for assessment and they call it stealth assessment because the student doesn't realize they're actually being assessed. So they're collecting data about how students set goals. So they set a goal and they're led through a process here. They select a hypothesis and then they can manipulate this simulation and you can find out if the var variables they're manipulating in the simulation are actually helping them answer their hypothesis or not. So you're starting to understand, do they understand this way to do um, scientific method? And are they able to communicate their findings in a good way? So the assessment algorithms that they put underneath this, the stealth assessment is validated on thousands of students and matched towards human assessment with about 95% agreement. So we're starting to see ways in which we can use this to help understand whether students really know what they're doing or not in a man in, in a, something that is not um, uh, super procedural. And what we also see here is we start to see dashboards for teachers. And here we have, you can see uh, over aggregated data across a whole class, how the class is doing on hypothesis formation, how they're doing on their design and construction of experiments, how they're interpreting their data and communicating their findings. And then you can change to an individual student and see that kind of information. So here we're empowering the teacher to see how this whole class of 20, 30 students is manipulating it and giving them insight into how the students have been doing within this learning of a scientific method. 
If we move to the mid 80s, I was lucky enough to work on this project called Computer Supported Attentional Learning. It was Scardamele and Brighter's project at University of Toronto. And this brings us into a new genre of systems. We have to think at this point, we were just getting, um, we still didn't have the internet, but we had local area networks and we could connect uh, computers together between classrooms or within a classroom using a local area network. But what this project did, it was the first project that moved us from teaching students about a particular domain where we had the domain represented in a computer program to giving them a completely empty database and the students were able to create their own material. So here they started um, writing about, uh, again, this one was about the scientific method and they were giving their theory. They were saying, I need to understand what this theory can't explain. So they made these networks of note, note um, notes, but at this time you actually couldn't have a document that had both text and pictures in it, so you couldn't do any visualization. So we were collecting data behind it by doing observations and interviews of using this, but what we were starting to see again is also processes of learning, not just whether something's right or wrong, and looking at networks of nodes, like who's commenting on who and who's uh, building on each other's arguments, and we start to see things like that. And this is sort of the start of the field of computer support for collaborative learning. And here's a more modern day argumentation environment where we can uh, collect data on what topics students are discussing, which nodes they're connecting, who's connecting the nodes. And we can use things like social network analysis to show us either topic graphs or graphs of how an argumentation is being built or who is giving us, um, who's being, uh, you know, uh, participating more than others, etc. So we start to use new methods of analysis to give us visualizations of different kinds of networks. And this can empower, again, both a student or a teacher, these kinds of visualizations to see how the participation is growing. And we get networks of social interaction as well. Here's another funny one I like to show because this one's interesting. It's sort of showing us here they're collecting, they built, built this table that shows uh, LED lights that light up when based on your voice data. So they have a voice sensor in the middle and they show you how much you're participating and contributing to a uh, discussion. But this is moving us into something I'm, I just named multimodal data where we have more than just computer uh, access data, but it's, it's voice data and it's giving you immediate feedback on, to show you how much you're talking and maybe you want to moderate yourself in a discussion. And this can be also presented as a graph in some way. So you can see how much you participated in a conversation. When we moved into the mid nineties, <clears throat> into 2000, we started to see online learning coming around. Again, we're still, until 94, we were pre-internet and the internet really wasn't available till the end of the nineties or early 2000s for a lot of people. So I'm gonna show you from a project that we had um, where we use this, this system called TeamWave Workplace. It sat on a server, students had to dial in and connect to it, but I had students all over Norway and what was I going to do and how was I going to understand what they're doing? Well, they would log on and they could use 13 different tools. They got an assignment where they had to design a learning room and we collected log data. So this is the start of being able to collect all of this uh, type of log data where you get all the actions that they do, what tools do they choose? And we could make different kinds of visualizations. And this was not called learning analytics in those days, but I will argue that it is. So we had a paper at Ed Media and it was doing these different kinds of graph visualizations of how much um, different people in a team. So in this assignment, they had three people in a team. They're in, uh, visualized using the blue, red, and green for each student. And I could quickly look and see, and I say, okay, the team on the left over here, they were always in the system at the same time. Here, there was only three times during the six weeks that they were in the system at the same time. And it gave me some kind of data that allowed me to inquire further with these teams about how they were collaborating together online, because this was the start of being able to do this uh, online collaboration. So this was visualizations for researchers or the teacher for me. And today we have all these MOOCin systems where we collect all this kind of data and we get this clickstream data. Everything that they do is collected and we can make very nice dashboards for the teachers. So this is from uh, FutureLearn and you get this data that's showing you when students are in on, they're predicting who's going to not hand in the assignment, who's at risk of failure. 
there's all sorts of different data that you can use and empower the teacher for that. If we move through mobile learning around the uh, mid 2000s, we had all different kinds of dev devices. We had these PDAs beforehand before we got the mobile phones and you're, you can move it around with you. And here we started collecting GPS data. So we could locate where you are and the system could then present appropriate clues or site information in this game that we made. So depending on where you were, we collected this kind of data. And afterwards we could see how the different teams of students moved around the city um, collaborating. And we've done another um, project in lately where we get this kind of mobile data. We can now collect motion data, how they turned their heads, which direction they were moving. We can get the time and we can still get the positioning using indoor uh, sensors that you can put around a house. And here we looked at firefighters as they moved around in a house. This is a picture taken before the smoke was put in the house because we wanted to support the trainer and give him visualizations of how the firefighters were moving around the house. So we start seeing again, this new kind of data that can be used. When we look at games, here we have a game where we put um, used eye tracking to collect eye tracking data. So we put some hotspots on the screen. We wanted to know how often were the students looking at the, or the players looking at the scores, were they looking at the overall map, et cetera. And we collected eye tracking data, and you can collect the game activity data and statistics, and you can put all that data together. Sorry, you can put that data together, triangulate it, and learn about how can you help these players become better at doing their game. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the menu coming over. The I can't see what I've got here. Finally, we move into this area of participatory environments. And I used an example from some colleagues at the uh, Ingvild Rasmussen and her colleagues at the University of Oslo, where they have built something called Samtal Tavla, which is a talk wall. It's a microblogging tool that supports dialogic pedagogy in the classroom. And here you have the students working on a particular, uh, uh, I think here they're using Chromebooks in this classroom and they can post um, they, have a, they have a question that the teacher's given them, what are the advantages and disadvantages of driverless cars? And they can post uh, little items about it. They get their contributions shown in different ways. And then the teacher can get into this data. She can filter it based on uh, groups or individual contributors, based on hashtags of the, of the data. And then it gets projected onto a whiteboard in the classroom that she uses to drive the dialogue in the classroom. So again, we have this being a social sharing tool where we support dialogic pedagogy. And we have all these different kinds of participation environments, wikis and Kahoot and Duolingo where lots of people are participating together. And now we move into learning analytics. Here's an adaptive uh, learning environment by uh, my colleague Ingen Molnar where you see students working on a math program and they have this little, um, uh, they have both the program on the computer and then they have a pad with uh, visualizations for them and she gives visualizations to let the students know how they're, how they're doing in this kind of learning environment. And then we have um, another kind of uh, visualization. We can collect motion data. Here you can learn how to get, you can get feedback on how you present. So how you're standing, et cetera, we can collect this kind of motion data and use analytics and give you feedback on how you're doing. Here's a funny one, which was a project by Ken Holsting and his colleagues called Lumlio, where the teacher stands, we can have uh, VR uh, glasses and can look out over the classroom and have visualizations of how the students are doing. They're collecting activity data and then visualizing it, not in a dashboard, but over the heads of the students. So the teacher can see who's uh, doing unproductive work, who has their hand up, who has uh, got particular questions, um, et cetera. So they get sort of a feedback. So these again are visualizations for teachers, but they're sort of through VR and not through a dashboard. And then we have in China, there's a lot of work going on in Squirrel AI. They've presented quite a bit at this conference. Last year, I heard a couple of presentations and they're collecting massive data where they have this idea of um, giving a simulated human teacher to every student. So they have a personalized learning plan and get one-on-one -on -one tutoring all the way. And then in China, we have the other side 
where you can have more maybe surveillance uh, type uh, work where you've got the students with the uh, headbands measuring EEG. We can discuss all we want as to whether these brainwave trackers actually work or not, but this kind of thing is actually happening as well. So in summary, we have many different kinds of data. We have clickstream data, audio data, visual data, facial expression data, eye tracking data, biosensors, location, movement, air quality, even I know projects about using fMRI data because now you can have uh, portable fMRI um, measurements. And we use multimodal learning analytics to understand learning processes. But the point of this is what is done with the data and how can we empower people to use this data to help them be more creative in the classroom, maybe for a teacher or to help a student have self-reflection on what they're doing. So we can look for patterns, we can do predictions, we can recommend like in adaptive systems or recommend resources, recommend curriculum redesign, et cetera, predict trends, dropouts, et cetera, and, and look for patterns of uh, feedback, learning trajectories, et cetera. So there's a lot of things we can do with this data. So it's data for empowerment for me. That's what's important. We empower learners for through self-reflection and giving immediate feedback. We can empower teachers for letting them have insight into what their students are doing and they can improve their own performance. And for researchers in understanding better how people learn. It's a very complex field. And I always want to end by saying, however, we have to think about the data. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but I would say I would always usually talk about access to the data, privacy and ethics issues around this data, and how we have to remember that we can't reduce people to just their data. Okay, so now I'm going to look forward to having some questions during the discussion, and we will turn over to uh, David's presentation in a moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Wow, that was a real leap through everything that, that happened. And I'm, uh, I remember computer-aided instruction when I was very, very young. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, pr pretty amazing um, to, to think what you could do then and what you can do now and how um, you really are starting to improve um, teachers' understanding and students' learning experiences. Um, and I'd like to come back in the questioning about, you know, the, the, the thing you mentioned at the end, which is what this, the, this plenary is about, is about how you think this is going to encourage creativity. So I think we'll probably go to David now and then let's come back and have that discussion later, because I think that would be very interesting. And I have a few questions that have started to come up. So let me... Um, introduce David. David White is the Head of Digital Learning at the University of Arts in London. He's President of the Association for Learning Technology and a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Uh, he has worked at the intersection of teaching, research and digital for over 20 years, and he's best known for digital visitors and residence ideas, which provides a framework to explore models, modes, sorry, of online engagement. He's a keen advocate for open educational practices and a well-known thinker in online education. You can find more out about him at his, and his work at daveowhite.com or follow him at Dave O. White in Twitter. Okay, thank you very much. And David's talk is entitled Cultivating Collective Creativity. Over to you. Thank you and thanks for the introduction. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so yeah, cultivating collective creativity. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Head of Digital Learning at the University of the Arts London. And in a way, we are an institution that's all about collective creativity. There is um, 20,000 plus students at the university, 2,000 plus staff. So we're interested in that idea of of how we can cultivate creativity, but at scale. And the idea of creativity, the notion of creativity is something that seems to be, be becoming more and more popular, you know, beyond the creative arts. If you think about organizations like the OECD, the World Economic Forum, they, they've got these sort of top 10 lists of attributes that the next generation is gonna need and creativity is racing up those lists. It's generally speaking the top five now, whereas even just a few years ago, it was towards the bottom of those top tens. And so we, 
we're beginning to talk about creativity more. And I think that's partly as a result of digital technology, because we feel the need to distinguish ourselves from the technology. And I think we feel that creativity helps us to do that. There's no point in us going out into the world with attributes and skills that the technology can do better on its own, in inverted commas. But what do we mean by creativity? I think we've all got our own ideas about it, but it's useful to define. This is a, this is a very helpful definition, original and effective. Ken Robinson uh, said original and of value. So that's the definition I, I, I'm using uh, in this talk. And the second part of the definition, effective or of value, is really helpful because it allows us to apply the idea of creativity to lots of different contexts. It, just, it doesn't have to be an, an arts context at all. So effective could mean it makes money. It could be something as straight down the line as that. Um, effective can mean any number of things depending on the context. The first bit, original, that's really interesting. Um, because original is different from random, okay? Uh, and I think that's important when we're considering what we mean by creativity. Um, it's about intention and it's about agency. And both of those things are incredibly important to us at the University of the Arts London in terms of our, our philosophy of education. Um, so in that sense, my view a lot of people's views is, is that um, creativity is a fundamentally human trait. If I invented a robot which could um, paint oil paintings, then the creativity would be in the way that I'd program the robot. The, the creativity still lies with me. And this is the, a debate that rages on, obviously. Uh, and it's been going for a while. So here's uh, Macrina uh, from quite a long time ago, as you can see. What's that, 1,600, 1,700 years ago? Um, and this is very much the, the sort of mind-body philosophy. And yes, this is a rabbit hole, but it's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful rabbit hole, uh, whereby she's saying that actually we can see sort of beyond the immediate, we can perceive the hidden structure of the world. And Sean Michael Morris gave a great um, talk yesterday morning, which was about uh, literacies of imagination. And it's very much about that creativity from uh, certainly from my perspective and certainly in terms of running uh, a creative arts university. But sometimes what happens is we link the idea of creativity to the individual, to this idea of genius, this idea of talent. And it's sometimes even the, sen the, the concept of talent can be quite dangerous, this idea that, well, you're, you're, you're born with it or you're not born with it. Um, but Actually, even when you look at artworks like uh, Jackson Pollock, and this is somebody de um, demonstrating Pollock's method, even when you look at these works, there is intention there. This is not random. The, the originator of the work, they might be an auteur, but they understand their own work. They understand what they're trying to achieve. Here's another piece of work by a colleague of mine. From a distance, it looks like it's random. But when we look at it more closely, we can see it's original. OK, we can see the intention in there. But what happens when we think about creativity more broadly, sort of as a collective act, as a group act, um, this idea of, of a, a creative institution, for example? And I think the easiest way to think about that is that it's more like tending a garden than building a factory. OK. Sometimes we get asked the question, is it possible to teach creativity? And my answer is, eh, that's the actual, that's actually the answer. It's, like, mm. it's, it's a difficult thing to do directly, but what we can do is create the conditions for creativity to flourish. And I'd argue that we need to have a broad understanding of what we mean by teaching. Because for me, teaching is about creating conditions. And therefore, the answer to the question is, yeah, you, you, you can teach creativity by creating the conditions as part of the role of the educator. So here's some conditions for collective creativity um, that I've developed with colleagues. Um, and this is not meant to be holistic. You can have any number of these, but I just wanted to put these up today 
And I think what's interesting about these having, you know, put them together and, and looked at them again is that if you look at the second half of each of them, then rules, definitions and product tend to be what institutions sort of move towards as they institutionalize. Whereas successful groups of, or collectives of creativity, if you like, uh, tend to focus on spaces, connection, connections and process. Now, it's not to say they don't have rules, definitions or products. It's just about emphasis. And I think emphasis is really important. So just thinking about it from a data point of view and from a digital point of view, you know, are the systems that we're inventing, are they looking to um, create, are they looking to systematize uh, processes or approaches? Are they looking to, to converge or are they creating spaces within which creativity, thinking and imagination can flourish? And I'm thinking about some Barbara's different examples and some of those did, some of those didn't. Now, of course, we're, we're a big university, so um, we also um, rank students. That's what, that's what educational institutions tend to do. And again, thinking of Sean Michael Morris's talk, he, he um, basically doesn't assess, but we have to assess because we award degrees. I think many of my academic colleagues at the university would be happy to not assess, but there it is. So we have an assessment criteria. So it's not that we don't have any rules, we just have very carefully put together rules and creating this, uh, we, we rebuilt this, Professor Susan Orr led on this a couple of years ago. That was a very creative process coming up with this assessment criteria and these are the headlines and inquiry probably leads. So we're really keen on the idea that, of, of asking questions of inquiring. We're more interested in asking questions than in finding the answers to things in many cases. And process is writ large there as well. And during the pandemic, uh, we've, a lot of assessment uh, briefs have been shifted more towards process and away from realization. We're more interested in, in the narrative or the story of a piece of creative work than we are in necessarily what it produced at the end. Uh, and that can be usefully applied across any number of disciplines. So let's just think about digital more specifically. And I think this is a tricky, this is a tricky area because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very positive about technology, but when we bring technology and creativity together, when we bring data and creativity together, quite often th there's a clash of philosophies or approaches. So fundamentally, definitively, technology is about efficiency. It's about getting more work done, you know, whether that be uh, Microsoft Excel or whether it be me digging with a spade in my garden instead of with my bare hands. OK, fine. That, that's fine. But it tends to be focused on efficiency over originality or our use of technology tends to erode to a certain extent the, the possibilities of the original. And so here's a slightly this is a slightly mean spirited example, I think, in some ways from Instagram. Uh, and this is this this just shows us that you know with network technology, it's 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 harder to be confident that you're original because if you post something online, if any other person in the world's done it, you'll probably discover it. I mean, if I think I've had a good idea, I'll Google it just to see whether it's just me or is it everybody else as well. So I think it's it with with the web, it's actually harder to be confident that you've been original, or at least if you're not original, you find out quite quickly. And here's an important point here, and again, this relates to uh, data, which is that I think sometimes what happens is, is the we bring in digital technology to the education and we're sincere about it, trying to make the environment um, more organized, more efficient, fairer, perhaps more equitable. But actually what we're really doing in some cases is we're eroding trust, okay? So we're mitigating risk using the technology. And, you know, that uh, an academic said to me the other day, if students feel safe, if we trust them and they trust us, then they take enormous risks. And if they take enormous risks, then really, really creative work happens. And I worry that actually most institutions first instinct 
when they're bringing technology in is actually to reduce their need to trust the people they're working with because they systematize. And I'd say fundamentally, if you're trying to create, if you're trying to cultivate um, collective creativity, then it needs to involve a lot of trust. And does our digital technology increase trust or reduce it? Now, here's an example of what I'm talking about. I'm not being specifically negative about Microsoft here. There are any number of, of, of um, companies could be on this slide. This just happened to be um, a, new, a recent news story. And these tweets were embedded in this story from, from The Guardian. And here's an example of a use of data, which is, well, I mean, you know, we can look at this and ask the question, is this likely to, to, to cultivate creativity or reduce creativity? I'd argue the latter. And it brings up an interesting question, which is to do with data and quantification and something that is actually can be really troublesome, which is that data is linked with fact, is linked with truth. So where we need to be really, really careful is where we are mistaking data as being some sort of fundamental way of illustrating what's really happening under the bonnet. When in actual fact, it's just one of many models we could use to come to an understanding of, of what's authentic and what's of value. So if we, you know, who's quantifying value here? And one of the things that worries me is that, you know, we're supposed to be sort of post-industrialized, but actually the way that we are using um, digital platforms, the network uh, and the data we have available to us is actually kind of just building us into the machine so that we, so with this, you'd end up stepping in line with Microsoft's idea of what value looks like if you're not careful. So it's not liberating us to be original creative, it's actually just making us part of the machine. And this, this is where we need to be really careful. I mean, just on that point, I'd say that all data is surveillance, unless the person the data is being collected from is aware that it's being collected, can look at the data and can interpret it for themselves. And I see a lot of educational institutions kind of sleepwalking into a surveillance scenario without really thinking of it along those lines. So we can ask ourselves, who owns these spaces? Who owns the data? You know, during the pandemic, most of our, mo most of our institutions work has been taking place in spaces that aren't owned by our institutions, including my own. And that doesn't have to be a problem, but we've got to question intention again. So what was the intention in the creation of these spaces we're now using? Was it to cultivate creativity? It might be. Was it to cultivate a culture of North American corporate culture? Whatever you might think that is. You know? And to a certain extent, we can appropriate these spaces, but we don't control them. And where does the data go? And who's looking at it? And what for? Because you know, I'm not seeing it. Um, so the again, intention becomes really important. And I find it quite, it's quite surprising that, you know, new features appear in these spaces weekly, but nobody asked, you know, and that modifies the way we interact with each other. Sometimes it improves it, sometimes it doesn't, but nobody asked, you know. So in terms of uh, what we've done more practically, more closer to practice in terms of the pandemic, these are some of the things that we have been, you know, uh, supporting our staff in doing with students. And I'm not going to go through them. I just wanted to highlight that, you know, you can talk about creativity. It doesn't have to be extremely esoteric. Actually, you can come up with principles that you can uh, respond to and it can lead to very particular forms of practice or action. So it, it's not just a philosophy in that sense. It can be a, a mode of working. So just a couple of thoughts just to round up. In my view, creativity cannot be systematized. OK, so I'm just harking back to the tending a garden rather than building a factory. OK, so you designing a factory and perhaps the engineering involved or how a, a production line works, that's creative. 
but the actual factory itself in essence isn't creative. Um, and I just wanted to remind us of that definition of creativity of original and effective. And I'd say once something's been systematized, it reduces the ability for originality to occur, okay? And we need systems, we need processes in our institutions. We just have to be careful that they don't become too much of what the environment is. So I'd like to imagine that our systems and processes create spaces that have the right conditions. Doesn't always work. So we need to be wary of that, especially given that technology and system are very closely linked. Technology and human activity within the spaces that the technology provides, it, pr pr provides that isn't necessarily systematized. I think Minecraft is a great example of that. Loads of rules in that world, there, there, otherwise it wouldn't be fun to use. But the amount of different things you can do in that world is absolutely astonishing. So I'd say Minecraft is a perfect example of a digital platform that creates the conditions for creativity, not least of which, because it can be collaborative and co-present. So just my final thought is, Technology in of itself won't save us, despite what many technologists might like to imagine. But creativity might save us. Okay, I'll finish there. Looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Dave. That was fascinating. And yes, so, and, but, you know, we've, we've got this conf conversation about what is creativity and how we create the conditions for creativity and then we've got all these learning analytics um, and there's there are a few questions that have come up but um, I think you you've talked about assessment and um, and and you've talked about learning analytics Barbara um, do we I'm, I'm my question is before I go to the others is do we actually need formal assessment if we if we can actually create the conditions um, and prove, and there's a question here actually from Aboy Verkinen, who actually, which is about the same thing, is basically, is there data out there that can prove your point? But first of all, do we need assessment because we've got all this data out there in the learning analytics and we can measure so much? And second, um, is, is that data able to support the fact that you can measure creativity in some way? So I don't know who wants to go first. Shall I go, shall I go first? Yeah, go okay. ahead. So yeah. it's an interesting thing about assessment. It's something I've really learned at, at um, University of Arts London. Somebody said to me, there's always assessment. So even if there isn't a mark being awarded, assessment is happening. Because if you're in a, a studio-based crit of work, everybody's assessing. It's just, a, you know, critical thinking's assessing. People get a sense of what's what they feel is good work and what they feel isn't. So I think it's more a question of to what extent is the assessment quantified and reified? And that's why I specifically use the term ranking institute. You know, education is a ranking institution. Mm. So what, what I'd say is that it's, you know, whether it's through the data or whether it's through marking, however you see the difference, the assessment is always taking place. And so really for me, that's not the point. My, the point for me is, uh, are you revealing the mechanisms, the process and the culture of that assessment to your students? Mm. And then students can make their mind up whether they want to engage in that, whether they want to be tactical, whether they want to question it, whether they want to disrupt it. <laughs> uh, but they are then empowered to have some agency within that process. And actually just on that kind of, there's always assessment. I think quite often when there's not assessment that creates a very inequitable in environment because it becomes what I call guess the culture. And it, it's, that, and it's that end of end of sort of end of course assessment rather than this process of continual assessment, which analytics can do. Uh, and that, I think that's so it's not getting rid of assessment per se, but not formalizing it in the way that we do. Yeah, I think I, I, guess, I guess my point applies in terms of making sure that it's revealed. Barbara, sorry. No, I agree with you. And I think that's what I was trying to point to that a lot of the systems, and if you have to remember, the majority of the systems I was showing are coming from researchers. 
And researchers do have this thoughtful, usually have this thoughtful reflection on what data is and where we can use it. We could have a whole discussion on, on that as well. And I, as I said at the very end, data is only part of the picture. I agree 100% with David on there. But most of the, the move towards process data is trying to understand processes of learning. So it's performative assessment for feedback under the process of learning. And I agree 100% that this should be shown to Mm -hmm. um, students and as we go and I mean we run into the new AI is, has a new research now and we have these black boxes of algorithms etc and we need to have explainable AI and we need to have you know insight into data and all of these these discussions are all there in the community and uh, I think we just need to be aware that data has always been there. Like if we, we have a whole discussion going on, if, if you're talking about institutional level of analytics, whereas most of my examples were on trying to support learning. Um, I mean, universities have always collected data, both about us employees and about all the students. And, you know, we have a, a research project on uh, what makes successful students at the university and the students, um, don't understand that this data is there. We're asking to use it for research purposes. That data is collected by institutions and it always says it used to be on pen and paper, but now it's digital. And I think that this move towards this digital kind of data has opened this can of worms and made people more aware of the data that's there. And I think it's also scary for me, and this, this I had a talk last week about is that, you know, the researchers hardly get heard and our systems and thoughtful uh, systems don't get into practice. What we see is coming from the commercial companies, of course, the Microsofts and the, the Google products and things. That's what we see into school. And why are they in schools? Because they make the, pro they make the job of teachers easier or they give some, they must be giving something to them, but it's really hard to get these good systems that um, you know, give us insight into learning into the classroom. So I agree. Yeah. So Barbara, can I? There's a question that's come up. Um, yeah. uh, just come up. It, it's um, from Christy. Um, oh, I can't pronounce it. Yurigi Ondara. I'm sorry if I've got your front pronunciation wrong. I do apologise. Um, but she, she, um, they're saying that. Um, you know, what's your view on creativity and data? Can can data analysis really contribute to creativity? Um, because if you go back to what Dave was saying, he talked about it being a, creativity is defined as original and effective. How does the data that you're collecting show that and demonstrate that? Oh, that's a really hard question. And <laughs> I think that uh, um, there are also, I, I've been looking at the other questions there that I think hang, in, hang along with this. And I think it's giving the data to the people. It's giving the data to the teachers. We work a lot on what's something we call teacher inquiry into student data, where stu teachers need to be able to have access to the data. I mean, when it comes to all these visualizations we see, it's computer scientists making the visualizations and they're probably not understood by most of the teachers looking at them. So we work with teachers and we work with students. Um, the work I showed by Inge in, 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 in Munner, the one with the dolphins, that has been very much given um, development through, you know, work with students and seeing what they get from that information and making them understandable to them. So I think if we're going to see data supporting creativity, it's going to be having to give the data to, to the people and let them use it. And no, someone asked, I think that this should be a special data analyst. No, I don't think so. I think that we have to have the domain experts and the teachers and students involved in the process as well, not just divorce it from, yeah. from the, to the data specialists. Yeah. What's your view on that, that same question, eh, how data analysis can contribute to creativity, Dave? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that they're enti it's entirely oppositional. No. I think it comes back, I, I'd go back to the point I made about spaces and not rules. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the examples that Barbara showed that I, that I was... I don't know how to say it, that I enjoy, would enjoy the most, if you like, are the ones that felt like spaces that students could move around in. They, they, there wasn't, it was a bit like, you know, there wasn't necessarily a right answer. And so I think that the kind of data that is helping you understand how connections are being made within a given space can be really, really useful. Uh, for me, it's a question of, of making sure that data is 
in, in, in the right, is, is approached with the right philosophy, if you like. It's not, you know, I, I've, seen it, I've seen it in research as well. I've done quite a bit of sort of social science research where as soon as a set of interviews are turned into bar charts, then they become fact. Yes. You know, once you've coded interviews and there's just something about, I don't know if it's just a fundamental human trait. Once, once something's turned into a number, we decide it must be true. Or, or at least it has a certain authority that's quite dangerous. So I, I could see data being really useful, but I see it as being... Um, like a powerful magic <laughs> has to be <laughs> has to be handled very carefully and has to be kept in context with all the various other modes of understanding and, and ways of modeling what's happening yeah but, but interestingly you you uh, i'll come back to sorry Bob, but interesting i mean you talked about um you know the things that you you do in your assessment which is first is inquiry is number one importance and two it, it's the process and, they, and Barbara has talked about that, about the fact yeah. that um, inquiry and process are things that you can measure through some of these tools and yeah. some of these. Um, so I think that there is something there that it's, but it's how it's interpreted. Is it how it's interpreted by teachers and what support do they need? I mean, we have a new question that's come up about the emergency remote, remote teaching. Um, and that, that's from... Um, um, our boy again um, and that's you know it, 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 it's um, following the learning process of, of the students is much harder when you're not face to face when you used to being face to face to them so what are these tools and how accessible are they so that students can actually uh, teachers can actually help their students at, at remote in remote teaching um, yeah I, I guess the the the, one of the downsides of everything moving online is that a lot more things become data or mm. every, every action, every interaction yeah. becomes a piece of data. Mm. And then it becomes, and, and, and I always feel like data is one of those things where it's like, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Once you produced it, somebody's going to do something with it. Mm. You can't ever ignore it. No matter what anybody said, when they say, well, we collect all this, but we don't use any of it. So, I, I think that it's it, that's the that's what becomes risky about everything being online is it gives it 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 has it gives this tantalizing impression that we can probably quantify and measure everything, and technologists, not researchers, Barbara, but the, I think sometimes the commercial companies um, sort of are hinting at the idea that we're tending towards this moment where we can measure absolutely everything and therefore you can predict absolutely everything. It's, yeah. it's been like a desire of, of, of cultures and humans forever to be able to go, well, if we could just write everything down that, so it's a, it, in a way it's about controlling the, it's about controlling the future. And my view is that that doesn't work with creativity. We have to accept that we can't predict. And yeah. actually that's a beautiful thing. Exactly. I think when we think about data, I mean, this was not a talk just on learning analytics, hopefully, because I could talk for hours on that. And I'm also a, a critical um, person looking at learning analytics and all data has a context. And if we don't have the context to the data, it can be really misconstrued. And for instance, we can have data on a um, student in a learning environment, let's say in a learning management system, you can see how active they were, how often they were logged on, how many things they were doing, etc. And you can compare that to another student who's less active. But if you don't know that the course that the first student was involved in was really designed with a lot of activities online, and the second one was in a course that didn't have many activities online, you could say that student was way more active and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And then we see these sad things in the States. There was a woman who was not a, was kicked out of the university because they thought she was cheating on the exam when all she was doing was talking out loud to herself because they were using the voice to yeah. determine if they were talking to somebody. So, I mean, there are many, many dangers with all of this data, but I think as a researcher, I think it's important for us to look at these to see what we want to do with this data and to see how it fits into the bigger picture of what, um, you know, what we know about and helping students. And I agree that it's about making conditions for learning. That's our job as an instructor and as a, as a teacher and how is data part of that? And 
to be critical to the data that is being being used and and being shown and we we are my my center for several of us are very focused on this issue of data literacy and understanding these aspects of data not just for um, teachers but also for students um, in fact at my university we're making a course on data literacy just even in even in things on you know, uh, machine vision where you can just change pixels on a picture and it doesn't recognize it anymore. And, you know, be, we, we need to be aware of the data that's being collected for about us now and actually how good it is or bad it is, if it's how it can be used, etc. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in that kind of um, uh, literacy. And yeah. Can I just can I just mention something in that area, which is for me, it's it's about making sure that there's a, a moment of interpretation. Yes. So I think where it becomes data is where there's there's no moment of interpretation. So I'm just coming back on that question about you know can we use data to kind of help with assessment, and I think we can. Of course, the data can inform um, that. But for me, data has to just be something that informs or gives context to a moment of interpretation. And once you lose that moment of interpretation, then um, your institution is running on the intentions of whoever wrote that program. <laughs> and yes. that's just fundamentally how it has to be. And we're, we're, we're walking into really, really difficult times. I mean, if you think about self-driving cars, which is a width, who's the self in that that's there's a, there's a phd in that but anyway if you think about uh, driverless and i'm tying myself in linguistic knots the point is that then the the moment of interpretation is so short you know when the car can't interpret the world it hands it back to the driver there's not enough time for the driver to make that interpretation to steer the car in another direction and so that's a really good example of where um data is not you know it's not a situation where data can open up or inform a moment of interpretation rather than simply turn a, what should be a, an analytical or interpretive process into something that's, that's more like a factory. Yeah, yeah. Right, I've got an, another question here. Um, some, I mean, we have a comment which is, you know, students actually choosing the system in which data should be collected and they get the results rather than just the teachers. It would be very learner oriented um, data collection. Um, and is there an example where that, um, where that has happened, Barbara? I would say that in some of the UK university, the JISC, your national uh, forum for supporting digitalization in higher education is looking at these ideas, what we call data lockers, mm -hmm. where students can decide the data is theirs and they decide where they share it or not. The problem when it comes to data is when who owns the data, David brought this up, I've forgotten to mention this, and this is a big issue. Um, and there's different laws and regulations in every country and what you can do with it. So we have very strict rules in Norway. We, we actually have to even talk to uh, the uh, competition uh, uh, advisory board. Uh, there's a, a I don't even know what it's called in English. Concurrence till seen it is what it is. So we have the people that that uh, watch the privacy issues around data, and then we have another one that makes sure that people don't compete uh, illegally. Uh, let's say putting grocery prices the same in two different chains or something. Um, and we have to talk to them to see what we can actually do with data and whether it's allowed or not. So I think this idea towards being more precise about who owns the data. Is it in, the, in a school board? Is it the school board that owns the data? Or is it the vendor who provides the tool that owns the data? It's different in different countries and different um, places. When you get to higher education, it's a bit clearer that some of the data belongs to the students, some of it doesn't, and we have to ask permission to use it, et cetera. But the university has a lot of data on us and they have a lot of data on me as an employee. And I don't know what's in my you know, employee folder about me. And we've never talked until the last, I would say five, six years about us having insight into that data or not, you know? So I think it's kind of interesting now that, you know, the data is relevant for everybody about uh, all aspects of our life, unfortunately. You can't even, I have a uh, Apple phone and I cannot get it 
no matter what I do, it will still know where the phone is. You know, I can turn off everything that I think I can turn off. But, you know, sorry, unless, and in the old days, we could take the battery out, but now the battery is not, you can't take the battery out. So, I mean, there's very much to think about when it comes to this data. Yeah. And can we have one, uh, one last question for David, um, I think. Uh, um, this is from Luciana Segesi. Don't you think the idea of collecting data about creativity is utopian? Isn't creativity or the creative process something in constant movement? Mm. Nice one to finish on, David. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, no, I, I, I tend to agree. And I think that's why it's really interesting to, to interrogate that idea of originality. And that's why I mentioned that creativity can't be systematized because it just philosophically doesn't make any sense. So I, I, I'd agree. And I think as institute, looking at it from an institutional point of view, there's a really complex and challenging thing that we have with our students, which is a, a, a student, a really strong student who does amazing work is likely to do work we don't understand. Yeah which makes things like assessment and data just sort of almost crumble. Mm -hmm. And so again, we have to have that moment of interpretation because yeah. fundamentally, if it's original, we probably won't understand it. Yeah. So, and I like that because then there's this, as you're saying, it's the, the, as the person who asked uh, the question was saying, it's constantly developing on the move. There's this idea of this sort of constant iteration of movement and this, this sense of being in these liminal, unknowing spaces. And I think, this really, I think it's really, really joyful. So from a data point of view, data is fine, as long as it doesn't impinge on the possibility of that happening. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really nice point to end. And I want to thank both Barbara and Dave for a fantastic um, presentation, first of all, and then for a really interesting debate afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, who's contributed questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, there's a lot more coming in. Um, so maybe Barbara and Dave will look at those and maybe respond to you at some other time. But uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. <laughs>